The Biochemical Society and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our biochemistry Focus webinar series. Topics in this series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. Please see the website for more details. My name is Mauro Rinaldi. I am a new lecturer in biochemistry at the University of Hull, working on synthetic organelles for multiple applications in biotechnology, and a proud member of the Biochemical Society. Today's webinar is titled Green Microalgae, the promising sustainable cellular factory for a greener future. And we will hear from Julani, Julani Stapelberg uh, from University College London. Julani is currently uh, studying her PhD with her research focusing on synthetic biology to produce recombinant proteins in, in green microalgae. She graduated from the University of Pretoria in BSc Genetics and Plant Sciences, BSc Honors Biotechnology, and MSc Plant Science Biotechnology. Her master's project was in collaboration with the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research on recombinant protein production in South African microalgae. Questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, but please do send in your questions during the talk. If you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown in the image on the screen, and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end. Julani, over to you. Thank you very much, Mara. Um... There you go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, and thank you to the Biochemical Society for having me today. Um, so I'm quite excited to be here because I feel like there's one thing that all of us have in common, and that's that we're considering the future. And I think we all want a greener future for our future generations. And now we're going to explore exactly how green microalgae, what role it has to play, specifically with the different products that it can produce. So microalgae as a sustainable future, it could take potential liabilities such as carbon, wastewater, or non-arable land, and produce these into valuable assets. But where domestic plants and crops have had thousands of years of selective breeding, we now have to look at microalgae, and we don't have the luxury of 9,000 years. We need to do something so that we can have the products that we need today. So we look, when we look at the vast potential of microalgal products and the societal benefits that we'd like to achieve, we need something to bridge that gap. And what we could use is synthetic biology tools. So there's a vast array of, of microalgae available um, spanning the kingdom of life. And we need to choose exactly which microalgae we'd like to focus on. So as um, Mara mentioned, in my master's, I looked at medicinal plants um, and bioprospecting these for their medicinal properties. We found some, but under no circumstance to honor encourage the unethical practicing and harvesting of indigenous species. So as a molecular biologist, I thought, well, why can't we just take the gene that we're interested in and place that into another organism that can be more sustainable to harvest? So for my masters, I looked at the recombinant protein production of different South African species and found a wide array, as we mentioned before, but Genetic, genetic engineering um, in these is, is quite challenging because these organisms are so different morphologically, phenotopically, chemically. Um, and that's really where I actually fell in love, um, not just with my now husband, but also with one of the um, organisms that we use as a control. So it's Chlamydomonas rain hartii. And this organism has been isolated in the soil in Massachusetts in 1945. And because it can grow phototrophically, so using light, heterotrophically within the dark, using something such as acid as a carbon source, or even mixotrophically using both inorganic you know, carbon and light. Um, it's been used as a model organism then 
to study an array of um, different systems and it's actually been published in more than 78,000 papers. So this organism is incredibly well characterized and each three of its genomes, its nuclear plastome, so its chloroplast and mitochondrial genomes have been sequenced. And when we compare it to conventional expression systems, so when we produce recombinant proteins, we could use bacteria, yeast, mammals, plants, or insect cells, but each of these have their own pros and cons. And microalgae can actually combine the positive pros of all of these conventional expression systems. So it can have fast growth, low cost, easy genetic manipulation. That means it can be easily scalable. It is able to produce complex proteins so since, since it is a eukaryote. And then also it isn't contaminated or can't be contaminated with human pathogens. So that's quite wonderful. And we're particularly interested in the chloroplast of Chlamydomonas reinhardtii, because if we do produce recombinant proteins, they will be maintained within this um, subcellular organelle within the, the chloroplast. And the chloroplast itself has its own genome called the plastome. It's about 205 KBs in size with 99 genes. And depending on the growth mode, it could have 50 to 80 copies of the plastome within the chloroplast. It's got its own transcriptional and translational machinery, and it recombines with homologous recombination, which means that we can precisely target our gene of interest into the plastome in a very targeted manner, which would reduce gene silencing. And this is pretty much, I think, one up of CRISPR-Cas9 because it's got no toxic effects. Um, and if we consider symbiotools, tools, so traditionally we use restriction enzymes that cut within the recognition site, but now using type 2S restriction enzymes, we can actually bind our restriction enzyme and cleave outside and cut outside of our recognition um, enzyme. And this allows us to produce these overhangs, which we can customize to our own purposes. So that means our overhangs can actually be designed within the coding sequence and within these DNA parts so that there's no scars. And we can also easily allow single in a single reaction, both the digestion and ligation of DNA parts. So this is quite a wonderful synthetic biology tools that we can use based on the Golden Gate system. So within our laboratory, the Perton Lab um, at UCL, what we've built is a Symbio toolkit for engineering plastomes. So we've built different modules, so different promoters, five prime UTRs, coding sequence, and three prime UTRs or terminators based on these homology sequences. Um, and we can easily maintain these on a level zero plasmids with an E. coli, and then we can easily build expression cassettes in a single reaction, and we can also then build multiple expression cassettes to then be transformed in Chlamydomonas. So the way in which we rapidly build um, transformants within Chlamydomonas is we synthesize our different gene, um, genes and we do this in silico and we also code and optimize them. We then clone our, our different fragments in E. coli until we get our final transformation vector and this we transform. So there's various different transformation techniques that you can use such as um, electroporation or glass beads but we particularly use biolistics or particle bombardment because that allows um, the DNA to go straight through the cell wall and through the double membrane of the chloroplast as well into the plastome and it um, entomologist recombination combines into the plastome and then finally we can restreak under selective conditions until all the copies within the plastome are homoplastic so all of them contain our transgene of interest and then finally, we can analyze our transforms and see exactly what it is that has is, is, our, is our recombinant protein being produced, um, or perhaps if there was something else that we explored, we can analyze the effect of that. So we also use a synthetic biology approach for genetically engineered strains to learn a little bit more. So we design, build, test, and learn, so DBTL cycle, and when 
I mentioned all the, the pros of using Kinetic Mirror's Frame Heart AI as an expression system, but one thing I didn't mention was one of the cons, and that is that it's still in research phase for many applications, and it has lower yields compared to other systems. But that, again, is where I think synthetic biology can come in so we can bridge that gap. And we can look at all the different um, regulatory steps from transgene, insert location, transcription translation, and subcellular targeting to see how we can really increase our common protein yields. So when we start, first of all, perhaps we can consider our transgene. So our gene of interest that's going to be a common protein. Um, and the first thing I think we should do is codon optimizers. So the plastome is particularly AT rich. And that means it's got a strong bias for AT-rich codons. And um, the codon usage can be tailored to match the available tRNA available in the chloroplast. And this would minimize ribosome stalling and really boost translational efficiency. And what previous research has found that when you codon optimize a gene specific to the plastome, this can increase protein expression levels by up to 80-fold difference. So that's quite significant. Um, so that's the very first thing that we do when we want to produce a transgene within the chloroplast. And the next, perhaps, as I've mentioned, is the insert location and also the gene copy number. So we said before, we can insert our genes with homologous recombination. So we know exactly if we design homology flanks where in the genome this um, transgene would go. And there's a few neutral sites. But one thing that we need to take into consideration is how we would select for our transgenes. So we can transform the wild type plastome to have our transgene, and then we need to select it. So either through herbicide or antibiotic resistance, oxytrophic selection, or through photo restoration until all the copies of the plastome in the chloroplast contain our transgene of interest, and it's in a homoplasmic state. And if we're considering commercial applications of our clomidinose Reinhardtia algae, this really needs to be done in a way that is marker-free. So we don't want any antibiotic resistant genes within the chloroplast, within our organism, because that might have a lot of regulatory barriers and might not be viable for food, feed, or other applications downstream. So the way in which we would make our organisms marker-free is we can insert into a specific location and select either via photo restoration. So in this case, um, it's a mutant recipient strain where one of the photosynthetic genes has been knocked out. Um, in this case, it's with a spiclomycin resistant um, gene. And when we design our transgene, our homology flanks can actually contain, um, it can restore a part of this photosynthetic machinery that's been disrupted and therefore restore the function of photosynthesis. So we can use light to select for our transformers, which is quite wonderful, don't need other extra chemicals in there. Um, and then this also ensures that there's less um, risk for uh, false positives because we're using light um, as, a, as a selection pressure which is great, but the one caveat to the system is that here we only have one gene that can be inserted into the plastome, and then also we are limited to only one recipient strain, so we can't really build on this and add extra um, transgenes within the plastome. So that's a little bit of the limitation. So what if perhaps we used a different system, and would there be a gene dosage effect if we can insert into um, different locations within the plastome. So another marker-free selection strategy is the CP-POS negative selection. And this is this one that I'm describing here has actually been designed by one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Harry Jackson. And here, what's we, we our transgene is designed to contain an antibiotic resistant marker that's also fused to um, uh, COD A. So that's uh, negative selectable markers. So we can transform this into the plastome and then select for our transformants using spectinomycin. So that is an antibiotic. But then once all of our copies are um, homoplasmic and they contain the transgene, we can loop out um, using negative selection. So 
the um, terminator here is a direct repeat and that again with homologous recombination would allow us to loop out the uh, positive negative selection marker until we only have our transgene of interest um, and therefore this is marker free and what's wonderful about this is that you can use this to target pretty much any site within the classroom and we can also repeat it so these markers can be recycled um, for future design build test learning and here we'd like to see okay so the plastome has uh, inverted repeat region as well as single copy region so we can see would there be a gene dosage effect if we insert our transgene from different areas in the plastome so we built standardized vectors and then using the different selection strategies transform this into clomidomonas and what we found is that actually yes uh, there's very clearly a plastome insertion site and the gene copy number has a clear effect on recombinant protein expression. And when we target the transgene to the inferred repeat insertion site, where there's twice as many copies in the genome, we do get up to five-fold higher expression. And so the next step that we can look at is, okay, we've got a transgene, we've inserted, we've determined exactly where we want to insert that within the plastome, but now perhaps we can look at transcription. So, in conventional expression systems, the stronger the promoter, the more recombinant protein or great expression you'd have. Um, but in chloroplast, um, there's a different uh, regulatory step. So translation is actually the rate limiting step, but it still means that the stronger the promoter, we could have greater expression. Um, and within the chloroplast, we have a single plastid encoded polymerase. And um, the way that the chloroplasts evolved in Chlamydomonas is through primary endosymbiosis. So cyanobacterium got engulfed, and then a lot of the genes got transferred from the chloroplast genome or the cyanobacterial, the ancestral genome, to the nucleus. There's a lot of gene transfer until finally we get ugly microalgae. But the, the plastome, the chloroplast, they might still be very prokaryotic in nature. So a lot of the genes exist as multi-gene operons. And um, this paper by Cavioli, they actually found that co the co-expression, um, the, they've identified the true transcriptional start sites, and therefore we can actually take the bona fide promoters. And we've identified these, and um, now we can perhaps see the true promoters, what the effect of their strength is. So we've built different standardized vectors where we've taken um, endogenous plasma protein coding promoters and we've actually synthesized these as single strand oligonucleotides because they are quite small. It's just the core promoter which is necessary. Um, and these single stranded oligonucleotides we've annealed and we've built a standardized expression vector which we've transformed and then through um, luminescence, uh, fluorescence assays, uh, we can really rank the proteins um, and the, the promoters according to the transcriptional levels. And this is great because now we've got a variety of different strengths of promoters, and this could be used for biosynthetic pathways with expression levels need to be varied. And this would also, if it's quite small, so 64 base pairs is quite a small fragment, and that would also prevent homologous recombination. So as I mentioned previously, with the direct repeat of um, the terminator that allows homologous recombination and loop out, now if our fragment is much smaller, it would prevent that loop out from happening. So we can build multi-gene facets easily, and it wouldn't induce recombination. So we can really rank our promoters according to the strength, which is wonderful. Um, but one question is, would perhaps the size have a role to play? Um, so the RRNS promoter has been excess, extensively used in prior research, um, but this is normally at 248 base pairs. Um, and now here we really want to explore, would the length of the promoter also have an effect on the transcriptional levels? So we built different size variants of this RRNS promoter, which has been used quite extensively. And what we found is we just tested this in coli to see how the expression levels are, um, transformed this into chlamydomonas, 
and they tested that in Candidomonas as well. And what we can see that yes, the promoter length has an influence on the expression levels. And despite the prokaryotic ancestor, the plastid encoded polymerase from the plastid has evolved to recognize unique promoter sequences. Um, so we can see within E. coli, the core promoter is quite strong, whereas in um, Candidomonas reinhardtii, the longer promoter was gave us um, greater expression yields. So perhaps there's important up or downstream regulatory elements which we need to identify in the future. But perhaps also we can add to our range of promoters and not just look at protein coding promoters. We can also look at the plastome tRNAs. As I've mentioned, it's got their own tRNA machinery. So we chose seven tRNA promoters based on prediction software as well as their structures. And then to this in parallel, we also added some synthetic cyanobacterial promoters, um, built our standardized vectors, um, and then in E. coli, we've analyzed this as well as once transformed in Chimidomonas. And again, we can see that there's different expression levels in E. coli versus um, the Chimidomonas reinhardtii chloroplast. And again, we can rank our expression levels. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of the synthetic promoters designed specifically for E. coli um, didn't work so well within Chimidomonas reinhardtii. For the next level, after we've um, inserted our transgene, we've transcribed it into mRNA, we would now like to translate it um, into our protein. And this is actually a major rate limiting step within the Chimidomonas reinhardtii um, chloroplast for producing recon proteins. So we look at the 5' UTR and the ribosome binding site and gene expression in chloroplast is highly regulated during translation. And this is specifically because of the secondary structures in the 5' UTR, and it interacts with nuclear encoded factors to regulate the mRNA processing, the stability, as well as the translation initiation. Um, so this would require the binding of both the ribosome and specific transacting factors. And surprisingly, the chloroplast 5' UTRs are very species specific and regulated by light as well as other environmental conditions. So we can look instead um, to bypass some of those regulatory mechanisms. And we've identified a few 5' UTRs to test, such as synthetic cyanobacterial ribosome binding sites. So these are very, very simple. So they might be able to circumvent some specific translational factors. Um, we've also looked at RPS, which has been previously published. And this also, it's a very small um, housekeeping 5' UTR, so that again can bypass a lot of the regulatory factors. Uh, PSAA is just a gene that we've used um, 5' UTR as a control. Um, but what's been previously published by Specht and Mayfield is that they've looked at the positive and negatively regulatory regions within the 5' UTR, and they've identified regions where you can replace this with just a string of A's or something, and that would prevent negative regulation. So we've taken that as well. And then we've taken it a step further. We've seen, okay, what if we change our um, Shandell Garneau sequence where the ribosome binds to be a perfect match to the ribosome? So a variety of different 5' UTRs, which we've then built standardized vectors for, tested this in E. coli, as well as once transformed in the Chimidomonas reinhardtii, and saw that this actually reacts very differently in prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, which could be wonderful because it could mitigate toxic effects during cloning. Um, and again, we've got a ranked set of strength of the 5' UTRs. And this also has a slight shift in expression pattern um, depending on the growth phase. And the cis elements within the coding sequence might impact the translation and the structure, so the 3D or 2D structure, could also impact translational efficiency. So this is quite curious because it could be a co-evolution of the chloroplast and the nuclear genomes, which could lead to the development of novel regulatory mechanisms unique to the chloroplast. So the next step is wonderful. We've got a transgene, set it in the in the plastome, transcribed it, translated it, and now we've got our recombinant proteins, but we want to prevent degradation. So one step that we could do is we could look at subcellular targeting. So within the chloroplast, you get the thylakoid lumen and the thylakoids. And one question is, 
when we produce our um, recombinant proteins within the chloroplast, they automatically accumulate in the stroma, which is where majority of carbon fixation occurs. Um, and when we grow these organisms in the light, the chloroplast stroma actually really becomes a reducing environment. So if we have a disulfide rich protein, such as, I don't know, hormones or antibodies, um, this might not be able to fold properly. And if it doesn't fold properly, it could be prone to degradation. So to circumvent this, we can actually look at the, um, at the stroma and the thylakoid lumen. So look at the, the um, subcellular organelles and see, well, within the thylakoid lumen, there's actually a lot of proteins that are disulfide rich and there's a lot of molecular chaperones available. So what if we just target our protein from the stroma into the thylakoid lumen? Um, and this can be done through um, two different ways. So either through the SEC pathway, which would take an unfolded SEC substrate, and then based on its transit peptide, transport it through this fixed CP-SEC-Y channel until it reaches a thylakoid lumen, or we can do this via the TAC pathway, which takes a folded SEC um, substrate, and then due to a change in the pH can um, transport our folded protein into the thylakoid lumen, um, where then again the transit peptide would get cleaved. And the way that we distinguish between these two pathways is via its transit peptide, and these vary in structure. So we designed a little experiment, again, to design, build, test, and learn to see which pathway would be, would be better for specific recombinant proteins. And we used Garcia luciferase, which has got five disulfide bonds as our proxy protein. And we targeted via the SEC pathway using a clinidomonas renhartii, plasticine, and transit peptide, or via, via the TAP pathway using a TOR A bacterial transit peptide. Um, built our standardized sectors, transformed these. And what we can see is very clearly um, the TOR A transit peptide effectively transports GLUT to the lumen via the TAP pathway. And the lumen here, in this case, is a better environment to accumulate functional disulfide-rich proteins. So this is something else that we can use. We can use the organism's um, intrinsic molecular chaperones to um, produce our recombinant proteins. So once we hopefully have accumulated high amounts of recombinant protein by reaching the upper limit of each regulatory step, there might be another barrier as well, um, and this could actually be perhaps a regulatory barrier because we are talking about genetically modified microorganisms. So a challenge I'd ask you is what, 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 what could that be is, um, well, by containment of a GMO um, could be taken into consideration. So we can use a biocontainment strategy, which has been previously published um, again within the group. So none of the 69 protein coding genes in the platform uses the stop codon UGA. So we can replace tryptophan codons with the spare codon. So the tryptophan UGG, we can replace that with UGA. And what that means is within the chloroplast, we'd have a read through, but within other microorganisms, the UGA would be seen as a stop codon and that would terminate um, the transcription. So this would mitigate horizontal gene transfer to any other microorganisms, um, maybe even within your gut microbiome, um, and this would also reduce environmental risk if our GMO species were to, to get into the environment. So our transgenes won't be able to be transmitted to other organisms. And the next step perhaps is looking, okay, wonderful. Now, how can we increase the scale of production? So we can look at larger scale cultivation. We can scale it up. Um, so there's these wonderful um, plastic hanging bags, which can reach up to 40 liters, or depending on um, the size that you want to produce. And we can look at the bioprocessing and analysis um, for our recombinant proteins, and this can be product dependent. And also the trophic conditions can affect the biomass and the protein yield. So a major challenge with larger scale cultivation could perhaps be contamination. So another way to circumvent this is we can use crop protection. So there's a phosphite oxidase gene, which uses phosphite for phosphorus instead of phosphate. And a lot of organisms actually can't use 
phosphide, it uses phosphate. So we've tested um, different recombinant proteins of different uh, chloroplast transgenic strains um, under sterile and non-sterile conditions. And what we can really see here is that our, um, this reduces contamination and this would allow upscaling to be more economical. It allows us to grow on non-sterile growth conditions, which really saves a lot. A less technical experience would be required for the team working and handling with these bags. And then again, as you can see in the middle there, these cheap hanging bags um, can be quite economical and easy to grow microalgae. And if we are growing with light, um, perhaps a challenge could be exactly where we're growing these, these microorganisms. Um, if we are going to do it outside in a, in a green glass house or something similar, we would need space as well as sunlight. Um, so in the beginning of this year, um, I went to South Africa for a conference. And in the lab, we've got these wonderful little photobioreactors, which can stimulate real world growth conditions for larger scale cultivation. And it does this using a global geographical database from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization. So you can pinpoint any location within the world and it'll tell you this is the average temperature over a daily cycle, this is the average light over a daily cycle, and we, we, we can use this to our benefits. So as I mentioned, I went to a conference in South Africa in the beginning of this year, and so I was curious, well, let me see how my microalgal cultures would grow in London at the time, which was January, so London in winter. Microalgal cultures didn't fare very well um, compared to in South Africa in summer. Um, there's a vast, vast difference, but this isn't really fair. So let's compare it rather with London in summer compared to Arniston in winter. Um, and what we can identify here is depending on our location as well, we can really get year round productivity. So this again should maybe encourage collaboration between different countries um, where we can learn and grow and um, really scale up um, facilities to a, a larger scale. So the question you'd probably like to ask is what, what proteins would we like to produce? Now that we know in what way we can increase our yield and increase our microalgal biomass, uh, what proteins are you interested? So over 100 recombinant proteins have been produced within the chloroplasts of Chlamydomonas renhartii, and these have been for a variety of, of different applications. Um, but where I think Chlamydomonas renhartii has special um, a, a niche novelty is the fact that it has grass status, so it's generally recognized as safe. Um, it's also incredibly nutritional. It's got a really high protein content. It's got more protein per gram than a steak. It's got a lot of omega-3s, vitamins, and micronutrients. So we can actually utilize uh, Chlamydomonas reinhartii as a whole cell, and this would mitigate downstream costs. And I feel like, therefore, there's this perfect um, space where, where microalgal um, recombinant proteins would be, and that's perhaps within edible vaccines, growth hormones, endolysins, bioinsecticides, or sweet proteins. And we can produce a variety of different applications based on this. Um, and this is a photo I took in London over the weekend, um, and I feel like the question here is, we can use in, bio, in algal biotech, we've got fast developing tools and techniques, these are easy to learn and teach. Using a step DNA library, we can really have standardization of our parts, and we can also combine biological knowledge with a design build test learn cycle, and this can improve predictability in future designs. We've got a grass organism, so the whole cells can be used, this would mitigate downstream costs, and with the right strain development and hanging bags, scale up could really be economically feasible. And the question again is, what proteins would be the most valuable for you? Maybe vitamin rich food, oral vaccines, hormones, or edible vaccines for agriculture, agriculture, endolysines. Do you think microalgae could be a promising sustainable fa factory for a greener future? 
And just a big, big shout out um, to everyone in the Perton Lab, as well as past and previous students. And if you are interested in algae, um, so the Microalgal Recombinants Network in collaboration with Algae UK have Piper Club. So it's an online seminar series that's completely free for anyone that's interested in microalgae to join. It's also got um, macroalgae and other applications from right around the world. And that's held on a monthly basis. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And um, I'd be very, very happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Yulani. Um, we can now welcome questions for Yulani. If you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown uh, in the image on the screen. And uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to see these questions. Uh, so, Lucy, let me know <laughs> uh, how I can see them. But I'll, I'll start with um, some of my own. Uh, so, I mean, first, first off, thank you for your hard work, Yulani, in this area. I think people underestimate uh, all the hard work that needs to be done to get molecular biology tools to actually use the organisms that we want to use to meet our goals. Um, and of course, you see microalgae, which are photosynthetic, are key to our net zero and, and sustainable goals. Mm -hmm. um, so, you, you said you brought some can you send me an idea of illustrative examples of what proteins you said maybe for foods? Are there any other particular examples um, that maybe also help illustrate like how long uh, it takes to produce the protein of interest and something about the economics or is that too 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 early to start talking about that? Um, so there's there's definitely some successful um, like all those strains that are being used today with, within the economy. So um, a company called Axitan, they produce endolysines within community motor and heart eye, and they use that for food and feed, specifically within poultry. And that's quite wonderful because it would mitigate, it mitigates the use of, of antibiotic, um, antibiotics and antibiotic genes. Um, so that's a wonderful application that where microalgae is being used, specifically in the example. Um, and, um, Sorry, what's your other question? Uh, well, no, you, you kind of answered this. So there's already a company uh, making them. I, I assume they're profitable or they're still trying to to work it out. So I, my question was around the, the economics or like how long does it take, how much, how intensive it is, and can we actually produce the the, the proteins um, cheap, more cheaply than the, the standard methods? So that's 100% a case by case um, study and be context dependent. But yes, in that case, you can again because you are mitigating a lot of the downstream costs. Um, one, uh, there's a paper mentioning um, Anel Vallat, and she looked at the techno economic analysis of downstream processing for animal vaccines and aquaculture. And there she also looked at different like spray drying or freeze drying. Um, which is the most economically viable. Um, so there's definitely a lot of potential um, for microalgae, and it again would depend on what 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 case by case study it is. And I think this is also where edible vaccines or bioinsecticides or something that's got a little bit more value than than biofertilizer or biofuels. So you need to produce something that's got high value, but also something where it's an added benefit that you don't need to to purify it. So if you're looking at um, really high value therapeutics, that perhaps wouldn't be its niche market because if you need to purify it, then you might as well produce these proteins in something such as mammalian cells, um, which can give you really good complex proteins. Um, and that price, that price jump doesn't really matter. Um, of course, thank you very much. So we have a question from the audience, specifically from um, Andreas Kolb. Uh, does CRISPR work in Chlamydomonas? Would you need it at all? So CRISPR works um, within the nucleus. Um, there has been a lot of successful studies there. Um, but again, the wonderful thing about using the chloroplast and the plastome is that it um, reproduces using homologous recombination. So for your transgene, you can just design your flanks and that would be integrated in a very specific manner within the plastome. 
So you wouldn't need this far. You can just um, design these and use the organism's intrinsic biology to, to target your transgene of interest. Thank you. Uh, Claire Fowler asks, how can we push for more investment in this area? There have been some big failures in the plant produce recombinant protein sector, failed companies. Will microbes suffer the same fate? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? I think um, what we have to do is we have to be really realistic with what proteins we can produce and what is possible. So instead of promising the world, um, say that yes, you know, we, we can produce specific proteins, we can use microalgae, these are the benefits, but also these are the challenges. And that's what we're looking on right now is how can we build on the foundational science that we have a bit more understanding of what works, what doesn't work, and also what our yields are. I and mean, then as you mentioned, Mara, look at the techno-economic analysis. So I think being really realistic with ourselves as well as our investors um, from the get-go. I know biofuels used to be back in the day, it was a big, big thing, and there was a lot of promise that it's gonna, you know, take over fossil fuels and be able to replace um, a lot of the conventional energy systems we use today but a lot of foundational research was still required for it to be techno-economically feasible. Um, so I think we need to be realistic with what is possible. And also we need a little bit more, perhaps if we have more researchers within the field to build that foundational science, um, then we can, again, bridge that gap between what is possible and actually bringing that to a commercialization. So I think, yes. We can, we should invest in microalgae, we can, but we should be realistic as well. Yeah, I agree. If, if I'm allowed to, to say a note, you know, it's disappointing when companies fail. Ameris recently went into bankruptcy, uh, but we have to keep perspective that those are attempts at using this technology and all attempts are, are great. And if they fail, it's because, you know, it's not ready. We need to keep doing the research. That's why you're doing the question. Um, Ralph Hayek asks, could we make a repeating system where any CO2 produced due to the industrial process goes right back into the chlamydomonas compartment? That's that's a really wonderful question. Um, to confirm, are you do you mean like a, a net zero capture carbon from industrial processes? If that's the case, um, so there are quite quite a few case studies where this has been successfully implemented. Um, even at scale. So there's a company called My Algae, and what they do is they use the byproducts of the whiskey industry, um, perhaps that's carbon or something else, and then they utilize that to grow their microalgae, and then their microalgal products are then really rich in omega-3 fatty, fatty acids, so they can use that as an interesting So in terms of combining different systems and allowing your pre-emotion and heart hair or other green algal um, cultures to caption carbon and then and then use another product downstream it's very very possible and it's a, it's a good something that we need to explore a bit more all right i don't see any more questions uh coming up and i don't know if i want to keep torturing you with this because these are pretty challenging ones they went hard on you and you you did a great job answering them and and, and giving a wonderful presentation thank you very much yulani again um, I'm going to go into my uh, send-off right now, so I want to thank everyone for attending and obviously uh, Yulani for a wonderful presentation and answering questions. You can continue the conversation online by following at BiochemSoc and at PP Publishing on X, Twitter, or whatever it's called today. Uh, we welcome questions for future topics and speakers to fe feature in this biochemistry focused webinar series. If you have an idea for a webinar in 2023 or 2024, we invite you to submit a proposal for an upcoming webinar. You can find more information about the webinars, propose your webinar, and watch previous recordings at www.biochemistry.org. All of our upcoming webinars are listed on our website as well. As And if you have missed any of the 70 plus webinars, that, you've, uh, that we've already run as part of the series or would like to watch them again, please visit our website on our YouTube channel. Details, will be, uh, will, details are being shown on the screen right now, and the recording from today's webinar will also be available to watch within uh, the next couple of weeks.
join us on 5 October uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, BST for our next webinar, 60 Years of the Cold Worth Medal, A View Across the Decades, Part 4. This is the final session in the dedicated series celebrating the anniversary of the Cold Worth Medal. And we will be joined by Ron Lasky, uh, David Lilly, Akilesh Reddy, and Sarah Takeman. Uh, sorry. Uh, as they discuss their leading research and share advice. The Biochemical Society 2025 uh, awards are now open for nominations. Uh, featuring new categories and a streamlined nomination process, there's never been a better uh, time to nominate an outstanding peer or colleague, I am not nominating one by the way, uh, who deserves recognition. The deadline for initial nominations is 1st November 2023 with submissions welcomed by and for uh, both members and non-members. Visit our website to find out more. Finally, I want to highlight that it's more important than ever to stay connected and engaged with your fellow molecular bioscientists. Join the Biochemical Society's community of researchers and specialists and take advantage of key benefits, including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings, exclusive um, access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, personal online access to two of their journals and more. Visit their website to find out more. On a personal note, I love to engage with the Biochemical Society. I signed up for, uh, um, you know, I registered to go to Synthetic Biology UK, which is a great meeting. And I think the registration is the same if you become an early career member as well. So you become an early career member and now I'm a full member uh, by contributing to a panel. Just get engaged. Just look, look at this. Um, um, opens and try to uh, um, apply for them and be involved. It's great, it looks great on your CV as well. Uh, it's a great uh, society, you should be part of it. So thank you to everybody and goodbye. Have a good uh, evening and a good week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jolani. Thank you very much and thanks for all the questions.